Out there are the towers of Midtown Manhattan. But in here, in the garden of her townhouse, is the quiet and very special world of Catherine Hepburn. She's lived here since 1933. Hepburn now admits she's 84 and doing fine, thank you. She still has her tremor, always will, she says, since she inherited the shakes from Grandfather Hepburn. But it's not as something, the devastating Parkinson's disease. On this visit, for the first time, she let us tour all three floors of her home. Hepburn loves fireplaces. The house has five of them. And on the mantels and the walls, her favorite pieces. Some done by friends, sometimes her own work, like this piece of sculpture. And in the ground floor kitchen, a Catherine Hepburn self-portrait. This she calls her closet, though there are no hangers. Everything is laid out on the furniture. Wouldn't the fashion designers who gave her a Lifetime Achievement Award be amazed? There's not a high heel in sight, and she doesn't own a skirt. This painting, also by Hepburn, is of her room in the house she shared with Spencer Tracy. There are many reminders of her life with Tracy, like this picture next to her bed, and also in her rather spartan bedroom, on the dressing table, photographs of the other most important people in her life, her mother and father. We talked with Catherine Hepburn in the flower-filled back parlor. She sat in her favorite chair, and we began our interview with the career that has made her a legend. Yes. Do you think that acting is a great art? No. What is it? I've, uh, uh, painting. Mm -hmm. I don't think acting is. I think some people's acting might be said to be, but not my acting. Then why did you want to become an actress? I have no idea why I became an actor. I wasn't very bright. <sighs> so, no, not bright, not bright, not too intelligent. And I thought uh, I was a good golfer, but uh, sports don't last. I would love to have been a tennis champion, but I wasn't that good. So what was I going to do? Persuade someone to marry me. Well, you did that too? I did that early, a yeah. nice man who gave me everything I wanted and started me out in this profession. She married Ludlow Ogden Smith, Luddy, when she was 21, but their marriage was not to last. He stayed behind when she left for Hollywood in 1932 to begin her amazing film career. I know that I'm a great actress. No, no, please be quiet. I'm the greatest young actress in the world. No, no, take and I'm going to go on getting greater and greater and greater. You'll see. Kitty, kitty. In just her third film, Morning Glory, she'd win her first Oscar for the role of Eva Lovelace, the aspiring young actress. Now keep quiet, all of you, and you. After you had much success in early films, you came to New York to work in a play called The Lake. Yes. Your disaster. How do you deal with that kind of failure? Well, that's, that's why I wrote the book. Because uh, I think that was a very, very difficult thing for me to deal with. And I thought, what went wrong? How could I, uh, an actor by then, two or three years, uh, have walked through a performance, which I did. Absolutely walked through it, thinking, God, I wish I weren't here. Oh, I wish I were dead. Oh, I hope this ends. With no emotion of any kind. So what did you learn about defeat? What did you get from that? Well, I, from defeat, I learned you have to know a little bit what you're doing, and you are the only person who is to blame in your life, really. You can't move on saying, well, I don't want to go this way. I'm going this way because you're pushing me. Don't do that. There's one person to blame, and that is you. It's, it's a rather um, ironic, I guess, that the most famous lines when people do imitations of you, and I think of it looking at those lilies behind you, are the yes. lines from... Alla lilies are in bloom again from the lake. And that's the line that's lived on to... Such is. The calla lilies are in bloom again. Such a strange flower. I placed them on my... I carried them on my wedding day, and now I place them here in memory of someone who has gone. Why do you still... I don't even know who was gone. Who was gone? <laughs> but you still remember the line. I remember the line. You cry 
very often in films. Do you ever cry in real life? Cry? Cry. No, don't cry. Only in films? I don't cry. In films you do? Yeah. So they'll know I'm sad. Ah, I see. Are you ever in doubt? Uh, practically always. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. Yet you're so definite. Yes, I am. You might as well be. But inside, you really are not sure it's just not outside? Sure. You have influenced my life. I have believed everything you've said, and now you tell me you're not really sure at this no, late date? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. But you say it definitely. It's all I've got. I have to say it. The soup is good. Eat it. <laughs> you have to be definite. Now we get to something that you and I have been discussing for years, and that is... You have often said that women who want a real career mm -hmm. should not get married. Well, I'm one track. So I just say, I can't. I can't. I think if you think about yourself all the time, and if you're an actor, your inclination is to think about yourself, then what about the husband and children? You're not thinking about them. So I'm very extreme in my point of view. What do you think will happen to Jane Fonda and Ted Turner, two very strong, successful, famous You're people. talking to someone who doesn't know who Ted Turner <laughs> is, so this you is really embarrassing. I mean, I know he's ahead of something, but I don't know what. And if she likes him, I think that's fine. This is the first time that you have discussed your romantic relationships in your book. Yes. And one of the most interesting, and one you have not talked about, is Howard Hughes. Oh. New York. Millionaire, movie producer, and record-breaking aviator Howard Hughes. Hepburn writes, millionaire Howard Hughes was the top of the available men, and she, the top of the available women. Not surprising, then, that he'd finagle an introduction. They first met in 1936, when she was on location with Cary Grant, a friend of Hughes. We were making a movie, and uh, an aeroplane, he, Howard, flew in, landed in the adjoining lot, and came over to lunch. It's a great entrance. Uh, I thought a little too great. <laughs> so I was mean. I never looked at him at all. I just looked this way and that, and paid attention to everyone else, and was furious with Carrie. You went with Howard Hughes for quite a few years, three years? Two or three, it? something like that, mm -hmm. four. Why didn't you marry him? Didn't want to. Loved him? Liked him. Yeah. Liked him very much. He was nice and a very interesting man. But again, I didn't want to get married. And she never did. Although there were other men like Leland Hayward, a famous agent and producer. And then she met Spencer Tracy. Although he was already married, he would be the love of her life. Come in, Stan, come in. The film, Woman of the Year. Hepburn was 33, yes, Tracy yes. was 40. Sort of he hit me first. Hello. Hello. Now, she once told me he was baked name? potatoes. She was more crepe Suzette. Uh, but it was magic, both on screen and off. I was wondering about this afternoon. Sorry. Um, uh, tomorrow afternoon? What's on your mind? I'd like to take you to a baseball game. Okay. They would be together for 27 years. In your book, you say to your readers, now be patient. Eventually, I will talk about Spencer Tracy. Yes. I have been patient. Yes. When you finally discuss Spencer Tracy, you say... Few people know what they mean when they say, I love you. What did those words mean to you? Well, the, the word, what does the word love mean? It means total interest. I think if the, the, the reason very few people really fall in love with anyone is that they're not willing to pay the price. What's the price? The price is that uh, you adjust you would just yourself to, to them. them now if you love back that's great then there's no problem 
And if you're not loved back, then it can be a problem. Do you feel you were loved back? Oh, I did. Barbara, you're very smart. I knew you were going to ask me that. I, th I think he hung around quite a while. See, you, you say it's, it's an amazing relationship because you say that in all the years you were together, 27 years, yeah. that you never knew how Spencer Tracy felt about you. Well, I never really did. Didn't he, ever never... Say, didn't he ever say, I love you? I don't remember. Wouldn't you remember that? I think I would, if I would believe it. But maybe I was reluctant to believe it. Why? Well, I can't imagine being in love with me. Fool to the air. <laughs> That's, that was a witty remark. Yeah. Was this the only man you were really in love with? I would say so. Here you are and were one of the most independent women, and yet you write that if Spencer Tracy disliked something about you, some quality, some yes. aspect of your appearance, you would change. Yes. What happened to the independence? You who represent independence. If he didn't like it, you change? Yeah. If he he said, I don't like this outfit. Please put on a skirt and high heels. Yes, I would have. But he wasn't that silly. What were the qualities that he didn't like that he wanted you to change? Do you remember? Oh, the obvious ones, you know, that I'm rather loud. I speak up instead of down. And th some of the things that I like to do, he didn't like to do. But she never asked him to change. He had been married since 1928. He was a Catholic. He and his wife, Louise, had two children, a daughter, Susie, and a son, Johnny. Johnny was born deaf, and Mrs. Tracy devoted most of her time and energy to him. Well, Spencer Tracy was married, and he never divorced his wife. That's right. Did you ever, ever want him to so that you could have lived no. openly together? No. No, when we lived openly enough together. But you have an uncompromising sense of right and wrong, a line that you don't cross. Yes. Did it ever bother you that you were having an affair with a married man with two small children? No. No. That was the line you could cross? No, I, d I didn't uh, think that way, but I certainly had no intention of breaking up his relationship with his wife. The Hollywood press and at that time the, the they gossip columnists, they let you alone. They let us alone because I think they thought uh, that we made a great deal of effort not to sort of parade ourselves around. Do you think the physical part of a relationship is very important? Well, I would have to say yes, I think so, don't you? Or do you not think it's important? My interview. No, my question. <laughs> you know what I mean. It's, uh, it's uh, how can one answer that question? Why do you like someone? I can't answer that question. Is it that you like to live with them, cohabit with them? I don't know. Or is it that you just admire them? I don't know. With Spencer, I cannot tell you. I cannot tell you why I felt the way I felt about Spencer. Old? Yes. Burned out? Certainly. <laughs> but I can tell you, the memories are still there. Clear, intact, indestructible. And they'll be there if I live to be 110. Guess Who's Coming to Dinner would be their ninth and last film together. Spencer Tracy had not been well for some time, and Hepburn writes poignantly in her book, of a night just two weeks after their work in the movie was completed. I slept in one end of the house and Spencer slept in the other end of the house and he apparently got up to go and make himself a cup of tea and the kettle was always boiling on the stove. I heard him get up, I'm a very light sleeper, and uh, I heard him go into the kitchen so I put on my slippers and robe and went out to the kitchen and as I was standing before the kitchen door, I heard a clunk in the other room, and Spencer was dead. He'd fallen down near the stove and was just dead. And I called Mrs. Tracy and the kids, and they came, and uh, they made the arrangements. That night was the first time 
that you met Mrs. Tracy. Yes. Did Mrs. Tracy know of your relationship? I'm sure she must have sort of gathered about my relationship, but she refused to accept it. I can understand that. And she had done what I would have done in the same situation. I would have taken care of Johnny, and I would have lost Spencer. So you can't, uh, I don't think she, you know, what do you do? You can't be definite about everything in life. You did not go to Spencer Tracy's funeral? No, but it, uh, I was not his wife. Has there ever been a man since Spencer Tracy who no. really interested you? No, no, but I mean, then I was old, so it didn't matter. You weren't that old. You were in your, what, 50s? Mm -hmm. That's... Yeah, well, it's still I, possible. If I'd been interested in tying myself up with someone, but I felt that I had perfection, so why bother? You know, there are pictures of him and mementos of him, you know, all over the house. Yet, you wrote a letter about him, which you read on public television. Yes. In which you said, I never knew you, I never knew you. I don't think I ever did, but then I don't think you ever know anybody. Since we're never going to know you totally, could you finish this sentence for me? Catherine Hepburn is... Adorable. <laughs> what, what do you want me to say? Or is it jackass? Which do you prefer? The last one. It's safer. <laughs> I'm crazy about you, Catherine Hepburn. Jackass or adorable? Well, you're very sweet. You're very sweet. You always call me Miss Hepburn, and I call you Barbara. So why don't you shift and call me Kate? I like that. <laughs> I like that, too. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. Yeah, that's pretty nice. I, th I think, Barbara, people might still wonder why, after all the years of silence, has she come forward now about Spencer Tracy? She would never really talk about him in a personal way, although she talked about his acting all the time, as long as Mrs. Tracy was alive. There is that line in her mind. Mrs. Tracy has died, and Catherine Hepburn is now friendly with the Tracy's daughter, and I think finally she felt she wasn't hurting anyone. I find that so fascinating that she had this affair at a time when, when someone like Ingrid Bergman was banished, but everybody accepted it from Hepburn because she has such a sense of And dignity. there was enormous discretion, too. There That's was right. no flaunting of it. That's right. Fascinating you know, person. I've done so many interviews, and every once in a while I think, aren't I lucky to know someone? And I don't want to yeah. gush, but aren't I lucky to yeah, know her? Yeah, I think her? you are. And you're lucky, uh, we're lucky to have you bring her to us. Thank you, Barbara.